Hello, and welcome to Aviation Deep Dive. The world of aviation in the 1940s and 50s was a fascinating place. Constant breakthroughs in technology, a better understanding of aerodynamics, and more powerful engines year by year meant that aircraft were consistently getting faster, stronger, heavier armed, and bigger. In the 1930s, the Tupolev A&T-20 was the largest aircraft in the world, at just over 30 meters in length and 60 meters in span. By 1940, the number of giant aircraft being produced around the world had exploded. The Douglas XB-19, ME-232, and Martin Mars all took to the skies within one year of each other. It was the golden age of aviation, and development only progressed more rapidly with the outbreak of the Second World War. Today, however, our story takes us to France, where a similar giant was in the process of construction. The Latakua 631 was in every sense of the word a flying behemoth, but to better understand its design, we must head back to the mid-1930s. The transatlantic flight route was booming, with such aircraft such as the Boeing 314, ferrying passages in unparalleled luxury and speediness from the US to Europe. It was an extremely profitable enterprise, and so in 1936, the Directorate General for Civil Aviation in France issued a specification for a 20-passenger flying boat airliner with a range of 6,000 kilometers. A quick message, uh, if you want to skip to the timestamp shown on screen, feel free. Unfortunately, my previous video has been demonetized due to a copyright claim. Of course, this should have come under fair use, but it's being claimed anyway. And if my appeal doesn't go through, YouTube will give me a copyright strike and actually delete the video. I mean, each of my videos do take many hours of research and editing to put together. And as it's a copyright claim, I won't be making any money at all for that video. If you can, I'd really appreciate support on Patreon. From just $5 a month, you can support the channel. If you can't, it's okay, I really appreciate you watching my stuff on YouTube anyway. Anyway, back to the video. The specifications were broad, but with the promise of an order, three companies ultimately began work on a design, these being Potez, Leo et Olivier, and Latikoel. With pen set to paper, the three all produced a design, with some striking similarities. All were hexamotors, or six-engine designs, and were of course extremely large, the Potez Cams 161 was the first competitor to really take shape, followed closely by the Sudest SE200 Amphorite. Latikoel proposed their design in 1936 as the 630. Intended to be powered by six Hispano Suiza 12Y inline engines, producing 930 horsepower each, the company laid out the plan for an all-metal 44-ton aircraft spanning 57 meters and 35.9 meters in length. Work began on a small-scale model to conduct wind tunnel testing, but overall progress on the specification was taking longer than the Air Ministry had expected, and with significant advancements in aviation technology since the companies had begun, they decided to revamp the specification. Latikoel was instructed to stop working on the Latte 630 design in July 1937, and instead requested that they modify the design to meet new requirements. The Air Ministry now wanted an aircraft with double the passenger capacity of 40, a cruising speed of 300 km an hour, and capable of carrying 5,000 kg of cargo. The range was not updated, and the Latte 630 was projected to have a range almost 2,000 kilometers above the requirements anyway. So Latikoel decided to put their focus to enlarging the design and increasing the speed. The old inline engines were ditched to be replaced by Gnome Roan 18P 1500 horsepower engines, increasing the power output by 60%. Interestingly, the Air Ministry was already playing favourites by this point, as the other companies competing for the tender did not get the updated memo, and so continued work on their older designs. Nevertheless, in October 1937, Latikoea had finalised their new and updated version of the aircraft, imaginatively dubbed the 631, and a small-scale model for wind tunnel testing was created. 
Testing revealed no real issues, and so the order for the first full-scale prototype was put through on the 1st of July 1938, Lathicoel beginning construction at their plant in Toulouse, in south of France. Construction would not be speedy, however. The plans laid out by the French company represented an aircraft to truly enormous proportions, 43 meters in length, 57 in span, and a whopping 10 meters tall. The 631 would be constructed out of 32,000 kilograms of aluminium and would seat 46 passengers in relative luxury. At this point, however, facts become a little shaky for the SE200 and flat out unclear for the Potez 161. A contemporary report from Flight Magazine says that it was completed and undertook its maiden flight on the 7th of December 1939, whilst another report gives the 20th of March 1942 as the date. Regardless, the 161 was the first competitor for the specification to fly. Both the Letakuel 631 and the SE200 were still under construction and nowhere near ready flying tests when France fell to the Germans on the 22nd of June 1940. In fact, it would be almost two full years until either were ready. Construction of four SE200s had been underway since before the war had even began in South France, but progress was painfully slow and by the time the first was ready, it was immediately seized by the Germans and taken for testing. The 631, meanwhile, had begun construction as far back as 1938, but following the German invasion, it had completely stopped, and Lathicoel's facilities were apparently put to better use cranking out war machines. Following the Franco-German armistice, Lathicoel was temporarily banned from pursuing this project, though after the ban was lifted in 1941, the company finally began construction again, the aircraft being ready in mid-1942, four years after the beginning of the construction. The results of their efforts, though, were certainly a machine worth admiring. The Lathicoel had been able to secure six Wright R2600 Cyclone engines, which at 1600 horsepower each, gave a modest power increase over the previous Gnome Rones. Standing at 10 meters tall, 43 meters in length, and 57 meters in span, the Latte 631 was in fact the longest aircraft in the world, was one of the heaviest, and was certainly an incredibly striking design. With the large angle of the dihedral on the elevators, twin vertical stabilizers, and of course its characteristic enormous nose, the cockpit was set back very far in the aircraft, about 9 meters, which remains one of the 631's most striking features. Shipped to southern France in parts, the aircraft would finally be assembled at Marignan and underwent its first flight on the 4th of November 1942, its hull smoothly lifting from the water. The aircraft's handling proved to be steady and docile, and the aircraft logged around 50 hours of flight. Construction of the second aircraft was also underway. Unfortunately, the aircraft would be short-lived in French hands, as the behemoth caught the eye of German officials, and under the instruction of former Lufthansa pilot Hans Werner von Eagle, the 631 was confiscated, painted in German markings, and flown to Lake Constance on the German-Swiss border. There it would stay for the next few years. Unfortunately, I can't find any information on German testing. It would have been interesting to see what they thought, but the 631 was not the only confiscated aircraft to end up there. The SE200 Amphorite, competitor to the same specification as the Latte 631, would also end up being taken by the Luftwaffe. The second prototype, now in fairly advanced stages of production, was now in a strange situation. The workers at the factory apparently decided that if they completed it, it would simply be stolen by the Germans anyway, so they decided to sabotage the project. However, destroying something as big as a Parisian suburb was easier said than done, so they instead opted to disassemble all the work, hide the parts, and blow up the factory. This apparently was a success, although exactly how they managed to hide the parts of the 631 remains a bit of a mystery. Regardless, for the next year and a half, no progress was made. The captured 631 remained in German hands, whilst the second, partially constructed prototype stayed hidden from occupying eyes. 
In August 1944, the factory was liberated by advancing Allied forces, and so the various parts could finally be brought out from their hiding places, the factory rebuilt, and the aircraft begin final assembly. The parts were transported to Lake Biscarros in southern France, and after three long months, the aircraft was finally completed. However, the so-called second prototype would in fact be the only prototype by the time it was complete, as the first one, appropriated by the Germans, had in fact been strafed where it was moored in April 1944 by two RAF mosquitoes. In the attack, the SE-200 Amphorite would also sadly be destroyed, an American raid would ultimately destroy the second Amphorite too, which sealed the coffin of that project. Latakoea, however, was not so unlucky, as with one aircraft they could still continue testing, which began on the 6th of March 1945, when the second prototype undertook its maiden flight. Having waited a good many years by this point, the third prototype was quickly constructed, whilst the second ironed out any flight issues. Air France was immediately interested, and by July 1947 had placed an order for, and received, four of the Giants, to be used on the transatlantic flight route to the French West Indies. The aircraft could finally stretch its wings and show its true potential. Cruising at speeds of 300 kilometers an hour, or 186 miles an hour, the 631 could complete a one-way trip across the Atlantic in about 15 hours, then from New York to the West Indies in another five and a half. With its colossal 6,000 kilometer, or 3,750 mile range, the aircraft was perfectly suited for its passenger route, and it would carry its 46 passengers in luxury. Sporting a lounge and bar in the nose, the aircraft had a series of private cabins along its length where passengers could order food, relax, and enjoy the view. The aircraft would also have two decks, the upper for the five-man crew and the lower for the passengers. Over the next few years, the aircraft would be built and enter service on passenger routes, with three French airliners operating the aircraft. Ultimately, 11 would be completed, including the first prototype, but the Latakoueur was about to enter an era of its service life which would essentially mar its reputation and seal its fate. In October 1945, just three months after Air France had begun serious operation of the type, 1631, on a route from Brazil to Uruguay, suffered an engine failure, where the propeller from the number 3 engine ripped free from its bearings and struck the number 2 engine, putting it also out of service. The enormous 5-meter or 16-foot propeller also sliced a 3-meter gash in the side of the aircraft, killing two passengers who were unlucky enough to be in the cabin which was struck. Though the 631 was able to successfully land, be repaired, and was put back into service, this was unfortunately foreshadowing a string of catastrophes that would plague the aircraft throughout its service life. Two and a half years later, on the 21st of February 1948, the 631 would have its most fatal accident thus far. On a ferry flight to deliver the aircraft from northern to southern France, the aircraft began to encounter issues over the channel. To make matters worse, the weather, which had already been poor, began to take a turn for the worst, as a snowstorm began to rapidly set in. Temperatures plummeted in the air as the crew struggled to keep control of the enormous aircraft. The crew was stunned. The aircraft was losing control in all elements of flight, and though they battled bravely to keep control of the stricken aircraft, it proved to be too much. A combination of the extreme weather and the dwindling control meant that the 631 began to lose its battle to the elements. All 19 people on board were killed in the crash, 
and a post-crash investigation revealed that the most probable cause was ice accumulating on the control surfaces, jamming them and eventually rendering them inoperable. The 631 lacked any de-icing system, and as ice turned towards La Tecouère over this utter disaster, faith in the design began to decrease. Just six months later, midway through an Atlantic crossing, another Air France 631 was lost, this time resulting in the death of 52 people, everyone on board. The cause of this particular crash was never discovered, and only a couple of fragments of the destroyed aircraft were discovered by search parties six days later. The official report concluded, The members of the committee are unanimous in attributing the accident to a serious and sudden event whose origin could not be verified with certainty. This was an absolute disaster. The aircraft had now killed over 73 people in the course of less than three years, and Air France deemed that the aircraft had significant shortcomings and was no longer safe to operate. Consequently, they struck it from service and sold off or scrapped their remaining aircraft. Over the next few years, the aircraft would not stop having fatal crashes. In 1950, an SEMAF 631 was lost after its aileron couplings were shaken loose due to vibration in the gearboxes. All 12 on board died. In 1955, the last operational 631 had its entire wing separate from the fuselage due to wing shear after flying into a tropical storm off the coast of Cameroon. All 16 on board were killed. Four of the 11 aircraft had been destroyed in fatal crashes, with one not crashing but still killing two people. Overall, in just 10 years of service and with only a handful of operational examples, the aircraft had resulted in the death of 101 people. The source of the crashes, too, had not been from a single fatal flaw, but from structural issues, vibration issues, a lack of de-icing equipment, questionable manufacturing tolerances, and quite possibly more from the aircraft that disappeared over the Atlantic. Despite winning the contract it had been designed for, and despite having a truly beautiful design, there was no denying that the Latakoel 631 was essentially, well, a death trap. It had never even been particularly reliable or economical to operate. Maintenance had always been an issue with the aircraft. They'd never been easy to keep going. In fact, two of its crashes were on ferry flights to Biscarros for maintenance. This perhaps tells you everything you need to know. Ultimately, the few remaining aircraft were scrapped, and by 1956, not a single example remained. The Latakoya 631 was without a doubt a marvel of engineering, and to this day captivates many aviation fans, considered to be one of the most beautiful aircraft ever designed. Regardless, its protracted development only served to delay the disaster that its service life would ultimately turn out to be and the 631 never lived up to the hopes of its designers. It did certainly have issues, and the decision to ground the aircraft was certainly justified, but many wish that at least one could have been preserved in a museum for us to see today. A flying boat representing the golden age of aviation, the 631 now goes down in history as being an enormous, beautiful death trap. A huge thanks to my patrons on screen now for supporting the channel, and thank you so much for watching this video of Aviation Deep Dive. Consider liking and subscribing for more weekly content, and please also consider supporting us on Patreon. See you in the skies.